Oh, World War I couldn't be made fun. It was boring and depressing. All you'd do is wait around to die. There was no easy bad guy, and video games need easy bad guys. The politics were too complicated. There's no room for heroism, etc., and so forth. Was the standard issue game forum rebuttal for years in response to the very idea of making a World War I FPS? But the day Battlefield 1 was announced, all those assumptions seemed to get checked overnight. For a while, at least. By focusing on aspects of the war typically left ignored and managing the impossible task of making early 20th century fashion look cool, DICE had somehow inoffensively made World War I look like a fun video game. Even real historians were into it. It was a brave new setting, being explored with style, and what I was looking forward to seeing was what new spin they'd take on the gameplay for. I wasn't hoping for strict historical accuracy, but I was hoping for creativity in its combat, as prodded by the arsenal of a very unusual period setting. Which shouldn't be impossible. Red Dead Redemption succeeded with no automatics in your arsenal at all. If there's a time and a place for another big game to take that risk again, this is it, right? Wrong. It currently looks like the idea was to have the setting theme Battlefield rather than inspire it. Of course, there is always the possibility that this could drastically change before launch or that all this footage is of people just playing the game wrong, but I don't really expect that. I don't realistically expect DICE to reinvent their game for the setting, but honestly on some level I kind of hoped they'd give it a try. It looks like a fine Battlefield game, and I've always liked the Battlefield games, but what I keep getting hung up on when watching their footage is a feeling of some kind of wasted potential here. So with ennui filling my time and curiosity filling my mind, I set sail to see how many Great War games of several genres have also struggled with the problems of making a video game out of 38 million dead people and four of the world's largest empires collapsing. And as far as first-person shooters go, it's not surprising that there's not a whole lot to choose from. Really, like 10 or under. And they're always half fiction. If it's not a weird artsy experiment, then it's a weird alternate history. Codename Eagle starts in an alternate 1917 where the Great War never happened. With no assassinated Archduke to overreact over, it's a warmongering Russian czar who decides to be an easy bad guy to give us excuses to shoot bad guys over. The game actually takes place 10 years later so that you can have functioning tanks, small automatics, and helicopters somehow? But more importantly, it takes place across sandboxy stealth levels with drivable vehicles. Players can fetch around items to do a kind of stop-and-go scripted stealth sequence or just blow their way through, but in either case the AI and scripting quality don't really manage to choreograph the slick action scenes it's aiming for. Which ends up just making for a funny story. As it turns out, DICE's bad habit of tacking awful single-player campaigns onto great multiplayer games started over a decade before Battlefield 3. Because Codename Eagle is pretty much Battlefield before Battlefield existed. Throwing tanks, planes, and automobiles into large multiplayer maps proved to be a great idea. It lived for a few successful years as a cult land party hit in Europe until DICE bought up the team, pitched a spiritual successor to EA, and the rest is multiplayer sandbox history porn. Unfortunately, there's no similar happy ending for the developers of Iron Storm. The studio did go on to make a lot of games, but they don't exactly make hits, including Iron Storm, a dismal portrayal of the post-apocalyptic future of 1964. Codename Eagle's alternate World War I never officially started, and Iron Storm's alternate World War I never ended, a premise that has the game riffing on the contrast between the brutality of the Great War's combat against the banality of its financing. It's all stirred up into these heavy metal aesthetics with the intro giving us a bit of black humor mixed with genuine apocalyptic bleakness. All I can think of now is one simple question. When the hell are we going to be left in peace? But games like this are why I think it's so important for settings to inspire the gameplay. Because once it's in your hands, Iron Storm is nothing more than a bad Half-Life clone. It's a seamless combat tunnel of bunched up bad guys that resembles the worst choke points of opposing force in Blue Shift stretched across an entire game, with nothing original or interesting going on outside of these exposition terminals. Even then, the quality of the writing and the translation don't hold up past the intro FMV. It's a bog standard early Audi's quick save em up. Even calling it a World War I FPS is stretching that definition. Which is kind of the same line that Necrovision straddles. Sure, it's a World War I FPS, but come on. It's also the goofiest bullshit I've seen in my entire life. Via con Dios, amigo! How have I never played this game before? 
This is the perfect George game. I adore campy garbage, and this is so good at being campy garbage because you can't tell if they know how bad it is, and that's the secret ingredient. Stick this one onto the same shelf you keep Sonic 06, Deadly Premonition, and your David Cage collection, even though it's probably more fun than all those. When a charge into the psalm goes awry, zombies and Lovecraft start crawling out of the ground to get mowed down by our hero, Dollar Store Duke Nukem. You are some guy who can inexplicably pick up two 60-pound German machine guns and just start blasting them away in both your hands. You're juggling dual wielding and a bullet time meter with an honest-to-god melee combo system to extract the most fun anyone's gotten out of the battlefield of the psalm. The horror of World War I is turned into horror fantasy here. It's not an attempt to seriously explore the war nor the horrors of it, instead it's harmlessly self-aware grindhouse exploitation. And that only ends up shining light on why this is a hard setting to gamify. Juxtaposing all these supernatural shenanigans against the Battle of the Psalm ends up creating good comedy. I just don't know if that was their intention or not, which is why it's good. The Battle of the Somme lasted four months, over a million people died, and neither side won. So Necrovision turns it into a literal hell on Earth. Even though it is goofy as a troop, the World War I setting provides the necessary grit to make it so enjoyably stupid. It's the juxtaposition. The land war in Europe is typically painted as a miserable, unwinnable failure of all the world's political systems. <laughs> which is the polar opposite of another side of the war that has been so romanticized and sanitized that it has already been fully explored by video games, three of which star Snoopy. The very first World War I game ever, which was also arguably the first flight simulator ever, was Atari's Red Baron from 1981. It had vector graphics and hardware similar to the previous year's Battlezone, because Red Baron was basically Battlezone in the sky, though a hell of a lot faster and less precise. But the funniest thing about going back and playing it now is that it still conveys a sense of vertigo. A moving horizon line may be the bare minimum needed to convey depth, but other moving lines implying mountains and valleys sloping out of this black void give it some extra depth. It's surprisingly easy to use your imagination to fill in the gaps for what's needed. I mean, what is a propeller really besides flashing concentric circles? Of course, playing in the actual cockpit-style arcade cabinet would have been easier, where you had art overlays of machine guns and crosshairs further helping you fill in the blanks. Apparently, no one ever bothered or were able to trademark a video game called Red Baron. Don't get confused between the 1977 one, the 1981 one, the 1991, its sequels, and the pizza. Regardless of public domain brand oversaturation, the most fondly remembered Red Baron is probably the 1991, the Gorad-shaded polygonal flight sims for Amiga and DOS. This is a classic example of the short-lived era when simulators felt more like fantasy fulfillers than work emulators. It's from the era of TIE Fighter and Wing Commander, where controls were simple, missions began right in the middle of the dogfight, and unexpected little disasters like harsh winds and freezing parts were just extra boxes to tick. The game is less about simulating the intricacies of every single instrument in these planes' as cockpits than it is about capturing the raw thrills of dogfighting pitting your limited visibility against your plane's turning radius and stalling threshold against AIs desperate to squeeze into whatever holes in those three factors you left open for them. One thing I really get a kick out of is the gun jamming system that has your guy furiously slapping their guns mid-fight to knock the jam loose. What I've always loved about these types of flight sims is how far they go to immerse you in a world, like how the front lines on the map screens are represented in-game by a giant brown smear on the ground. You'll manage a team of wingmen, read the news, earn medals, and refer back and forth between a map the game gave you in real life with the directions the briefings expect you to follow in-game. And none of that is really essential. For the massive amount of content that's here, the game's easy to learn and just a little bit of everything can be sampled right away. It's a stark reminder of how flight sims used to be just another subset of the action game genre. They used to be much easier for quick pick-up-and-play sessions than they are today as evidenced by Wings Over Flanders Fields, which is a modern follow-up to the standard Red Baron set, but also evidence of just how far off the radar this genre has fallen as how high the climb to play it has risen. The preeminent modern World War I flight sim of today is an unofficial expansion to Microsoft Combat Simulator 3 from 2002, meaning you have to have a copy of a 14-year-old game installed just to get it to run. Over Flanders Fields is not cheap, and it's not on Steam, and it probably never will be. Hell, if you just want to be able to mouse look, you have to install a modded version of paid third-party software. The setup is absolutely a nightmare. 
but it is the modern gold standard of a vintage flight sim, faithfully recreating how cutting-edge planes from a hundred years ago go as fast as an economy four-door sedan of today. Which was a fact obscured by Red Baron's Gorad graphics, but compensated here by just how much more work you gotta do to stay afloat without stalling. Flying these things takes finesse, and it's a skill to learn. Even the downtime of going from A to B is exciting. Just like how much more involved the incredibly detailed campaigns are. After a mission, you have to submit an actual report form claiming what kind of damage you did. There is a gorgeous and rewarding flight sim in here, which just makes me sad that there are so many filters in place keeping people from it. Whether it's for fantasy fulfillment or serious historical recreation, the options for what you want are here, and the quality you'll get has no substitute. But man, that setup. The decreasing amount of World War I FPS and flight sim games since the 90s correlates with a slight rise in strategy games in the Audis. Given a strategy game's bigger scale and lack of gunplay, I'm pretty surprised there weren't more of these earlier. I mean, there are like a jillion board games for it, but barely any video games. This disagreement between the two mediums is the visual theme of Toy Soldiers, an Xbox Live arcade game that has you smashing action figures together. It's an active tower defense game where you driver San Francisco between different kinds of turrets to multi-manage hundreds of enemy troops hopelessly charging your defenses. As the first modern war, World War I is seen as the iconic modern war here. The juxtaposition of wanton human suffering grinding against the oafish ornate sights and sounds of early 20th century commercialism keeps things lightly T-rated. This is the most lighthearted take you'll probably ever see on chemical warfare. After all, the idea is that you're seeing a toy box come alive to fully realize the destruction they've always implied. And any toys count, even the space ones. But that's just fun in games, and the opposite kind of fun in games that Paradox's strategy games are. Darkest Hour is a standalone Hearts of Iron expansion released by modders with Paradox's official blessing. It's not a dedicated World War I Paradox game, but it is the closest they've come to so far. Its small list of early 20th century strategy scenarios begins with The Great War. Which is, in practice, more like SimCity than Civ. Pause and play an insanely complex suite of variables through a timer to see a political, military, and economic simulation play out on an imperial scale. I decided to play as the long-since-forgotten concept of an isolationist USA, which meant that I spent most of the early years of World War I learning the game in peace and quiet, while the primary concern was drumming up political support for international interventionism before the 1917 elections. In what other game can you say you do that? After a few years of quashing congressional dissent, the Lusitania was sunk, which triggered enough votes to set the USA on a path that would eventually make Team America World Police come out. I love how no matter how big and crazy things get in these games, the simulations just work. Entering the Entente in 1917 suddenly lit up a grayed out map with activity all over the globe. But even before and around that, the whole experience illuminates the tiny little gears that motivated this conflict in a way that no other medium can. Summarizing the complicated empires, alliances, colonies, and revolutions that all prolonged World War I is a much easier task when they're all neatly laid out in front of you in a big interactive map that assembles and collapses their borders in real time. And there isn't a single beaming smug grin from a cocky ace pilot anywhere. Sid Meier's Ace Patrol is a free-to-play iPhone game with a $5 Steam version. It's not exactly a well-executed, deep, and complex strategy game, so much that it's just a really cool idea playing with the setting. Which is why I'm including it here. Check this out. It's turn-based hex board tactics with biplanes, and that's brilliant! It's a straight and simple way to force the player to think about their moves two turns ahead of time in a strategy game. Because planes move in a straight line with inertia. You can't just turn on a dime. Every move you make has to lean into the next, with consideration for when and where wingmen can swoop in to cover your backside. It gets you in the same tactical mentality as those flight simulators, but with enough time to thoroughly ponder on why, in the rush of a flight sim, you've been making all those split-second moves that you've always made. It gives you enough time to figure out how gravity makes these tricks work, and how and when you should be using them. Though I bet it probably works much better on a phone where you're flicking your fingers to pull off these moves. Moves, and the quick levels with no background music get boring real fast when you're not playing it in a waiting room. But it's still a cool idea, which is really just what I want. 
That's what I want out of Battlefield 1, but for getting what I want, Verdun is all I've got to enjoy for now. Janky animations and frequent frame rate dips flaunt its Unity framework, but it still has some sense of spectacle. But what elevates Verdun beyond a slow and clunky sniping deathmatch are the rules of the Frontlines mode, which gamifies the concept of attrition by having your two teams wrestle back and forth over the same capture points ad infinitum. Objective timers are paced in a clever way that conveys the brooding anxiety of Western Front literature. A few seconds of preparation gives your team enough time to neatly form up along a perimeter and snipe at dots cresting the horizon, until someone eventually breaks through and flips the switch to horrifying close quarters trench warfare. But hold out long enough and a whistle and drum signal will cue everyone to charge over the top into gunfire to become those tiny dots rushing towards the same scrap of land lost and gained over and over again just minutes earlier. Long, probably boring moments of quiet downtime punctuated by inescapable deaths do represent the obvious fears of making a World War I FPS, but ultimately Verdun does hint at the kind of game I hope and wish Battlefield 1, or maybe another spin-off, may eventually be. Though there is good romping fun to be had from the high risk and rewards of one-shot sniper duels, it's the strategy that creates this interesting gameplay idea inspired from the period. The rock-paper-scissors balance here is between flankers, machine gunners, snipers, and grenaders, but they all have to charge the right spots at the right times, since defenders are forced to concentrate on the mid, center, or right flanks, and adjusting respawn timers to balance the two teams gives you a sense of holding out against an overwhelming force even when there's not a lot of players in the server. But Verdun's corner of this niche market shouldn't be the end of it. It could be the inspiration for a bigger company to make a more slick and accessible World War I FPS, a game that's maybe not about fast-paced twitch shooting, but rather strategic victories made through line-of-fire dominance versus smart flanking, but really it doesn't matter what I'm imagining. If there's one thing that playing all these games has showed me and maybe made me change my mind on, it's that common excuse of World War I lacking enough content to make a big fancy game. That is just that, an excuse. It was around the time that I was having genuine fun playing Necrovision that I came to this shocking conclusion. Video games can be anything because they aren't real. Historical settings don't have to impose strict limitations. With a little bit of risk, they can inspire creative workarounds or hone in on finely tuning a new gameplay concept. Here's a few ideas that really shouldn't be as hard as people make them out to be. Why can't a World War I FPS figure out how to make being a machine gun turret interesting? Why can't someone make Verdun but slicker, faster, and more polished? Why has no one made a survival horror game in the trenches yet? Here's a more weirder concept. A World War I grand strategy game where the win state is to prevent there ever being a World War II. There don't have to be all these limitations imposed on a game from its setting, because games can be whatever they want to be. The real limitation is that it's the industry, and in many ways their customers, that are so resistant to change, not game ideas themselves. Exploring history to inspire games to break trends and create new concepts could have created much more interesting games this whole time. Potentially inspiring games, thought up from inspired ideas. So, now, uh, just to kind of give everyone an update as to what it is that we're going to be playing, it will be Conquest, what you know, what you love from Battlefield.